Life can be heavy, a burden which at times seems unbearable. It's easy to find ourselves overwhelmed, weighed down, or even crushed. Often these struggles come and go, a nuisance, an annoyance, yet sometimes they grab a hold, gripping every aspect of our lives, pulling us down, consuming our hope. It's hard to breathe under the weight of our anxieties. It's difficult to move forward when we're anchored to our worries. But God loves us too much to let us stay this way. He wants to replace our anxiety with hope, our fear with courage, our worries with peace, and our burdens with freedom. In moments when life begins to weigh you down, remember this one simple truth. We serve a faithful God, a God who's offered to carry our burdens and asks us to cast all our cares on Him. Good morning, brethren. It is quite true that we live in a difficult moment. I just look around me and look around our society and we see much pain. We see a lot of suffering. We see sadness. Grief, grief is rampant. We find, we see all around us people mourning the, the loss of loved ones. We see people looking for hope in the, in the wrong places and not finding it and falling into despair. It's a very difficult time. But it is in times like these that people ask precious questions. Questions such as, what is it all about? Why are we even here? And what can we do about it? Now, some of these questions have been addressed in the previous weeks. We had talked about it as we looked at God's plan for humanity and His promises for us. But I would like to go to the Apostle Paul because Paul's world was also a difficult world. Life was not easy for him. Life was not easy for his brothers and sisters in those days either. And as he addressed the challenges of life in his letter to the Ephesians, which we're going to be looking at today, he seemed to concentrate the whole letter on one vital point. And that vital point is the point of love. Love as a verb in the letter to the Ephesians is used nine times out of 23 times in all of Paul's letters. As a noun, it is used 10 times out of 65 times in all of Paul's letters. So that means that more than one-sixth of his references to love are found right here in a letter to the Ephesians. But let's look at what God inspired Paul to share with all of us. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of a faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease give, giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of his glory of His inheritance in the saints, and that is, and what is the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him on His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion 
and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Brethren, I, I'm, I was shocked to notice that in the Greek, this is all one sentence. Just one sentence. But looking past the complexity of language that Paul uses, a question emerges here, because this, in the midst of all the problems that we find in life, in the midst of all the trials that Paul experienced, in the midst of all things that were going on, this is looking at friendship. But what makes a friendship? And, and yes, that is what Paul is referring to. Paul shows us that the Lord wants to establish a friendship with us. He is establishing a friendship with us, a profound friendship, a communion of love. And he tells us how and why. At the opening of this letter, Paul reminded the Ephesians of the amazing blessings that God had bestowed upon all of them in Christ. And then he continues here in verse 15, as we just read. Let's review it, verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So for this reason it's because God bestowed on the believers every spiritual blessing as he had just mentioned at the beginning of the letter. Because God bestows upon us every spiritual blessing, Paul now prayed that they might know God more personally. Now there's one thing in, in, in this statement here, that Paul is not praying for things. He's praying for them that God would connect them with Christ, that God would give them a communion with Christ, that God would bless them in that oneness that he has granted us to have in Christ. Paul is not asking for blessings of property or, or possessions or things in this world. Now, having heard of their faith in the Lord and their love for the saints, Paul heard about what was going on in, in, Ephesians, in Ephesus, in the Ephesians, uh, in the life of the church in, in Ephesus, in the Ephesians. God heard that their faith in the Lord was so much that it, it just was talked about and was related to him. So trust in God is what we find in here, a trust in God that leads to love for one another. The two are connected here, and they're connected elsewhere in Scripture. In the writings of Paul, Paul reminds us in 1 Timothy 1.5 that the goal of his instruction, the goal of the instruction of his and his companions was love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So again, a faith, a trust in God that leads to the expression of love, God's love, toward one another. It's a very important statement. It's a very important message. Now, in addition to that, Paul stated that he did not cease giving thanks for them. So already, it reminds us that prayer is not just to ask God for something. Unfortunately, it seems like all too many times prayers become a list, a want list. I want this, I want that. But prayer is not just to ask God for, for things or for blessings even. It's also to give thanks to God. 
giving thanks for something that God has granted to others in this case, and not even just us. Paul was gracious, I mean, grateful and thankful to the Lord for having blessed the Ephesians, for having granted the Ephesians to have that faith and the expression of the Lord's love. And then it says, making mention of you in my prayers, implied in there, it, it seems that he would pray for them no matter what. But as he's praying for them, he's glad and he rejoices in their faith. He rejoices in their expression of love. And so he gives thanks to God for that. So while praying for them, Paul praises God and praises God for what he has given to them. So, brethren, do we pray for one another, first of all? Or do we just pray for ourselves? And then, as we pray, what do we pray for? The prayers of the saints are essential to the growth, essential to the growth of a, and the well-being of the church. The church will not advance without the prayers of the saints. You know, oftentimes we, we think of, of people being involved in the service of the church as, as, you know, being important when they are evident, when they're uh, maybe uh, on the stage or doing things that are noticed. But what about the people that are serving the church in prayer? They are really the backbone of the church. As an old saying goes, the church will advance on its knees. And so Paul here sets not only a good example, but almost like a calling for us to imitate him, to not cease giving thanks for one another, making mention of each other in our prayers. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. Yes, indeed, Paul is asking for something. Paul prayed more specifically for God to give the Ephesians something, but notice that it's not anything material. It is something much more important. It is something spiritual. That the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give them a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Him. The spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Much could be said about that, but I think it's easy for us to understand that He's talking about our ability to understand the true nature of things and how things actually really work. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. But wisdom is not just information. Wisdom is the ability to use that and to understand it in the proper context. So the ability to understand the true nature of things and to apply them in a correct way is what is implied here. And the revelation, of course, is referring to the revelation of the things of God. But notice that statement, in the knowledge of Him, in the knowledge of God. Now, the world wants us to concentrate on ourselves. The world brings misery because it's all about us. It, it, it promotes a selfishness in innumerable ways. And it wants us to get to know ourselves. Notice here what God in, inspires the Apostle Paul to pray for, that we may grow that we may have, that we may be blessed and have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. So, knowing not just ourselves, but knowing God. And brethren, let me, let me make it very clear. If we really want to understand the true meaning of being human, we need to look not at ourselves. We need to look at Jesus Christ. We need to look at God himself, the God who made himself human, the one who is the only perfect human who ever walked on the face of the earth. 
So God invites us to know Him in Jesus Christ, who is the source of all true blessings. God wants us to get to know Him personally, intimately, experientially. And notice, not knowing about Him, but knowing Him personally. To really get to know someone, however, we need to spend time with them. Can we get to know one another if we never see each other? Can we get to know one another if we never talk to one another? Of course, to really know someone, we need to engage our time with them, to interact with them, to fellowship with them. And that is what God has offered us. And that is what Paul is thanking God for and is praying that God would connect the Ephesian church, not just with one another, but ab above all and primarily with God himself, with Jesus Christ the Lord. Verses 18 and 19. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, notice that. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. It is clear that he is not talking about something missing here but something already present. What we need to see is already present. What we need to see is what God has done. But we may not see it because we looked to other things and, or, or, or for the wrong things around us. You know, if something is on my right and I turn and, and look at my left, I may not be able to see what's on my right. But God moved Paul to pray that we would be enlightened to be able to see, to see what God has for us. And what is that? The hope of his calling. God has called us to be different from the world, brethren. The world lives and is in darkness. But he granted us to be called to the light. And let me remind you something about darkness, which I think is very important, especially nowadays, because all too often I hear people talking about the, the things that are happening, bringing darkness into their life. Brethren, life is definitely precious. And, and, and life sometimes exposes us to moments of darkness. But we need to understand that darkness is not something that is being added. Rather, it's the absence of something. It, it, it physically is the same. Darkness is not an energy, it's not a power. Darkness actually is the absence of energy. Light, on the opposite, is energy. And in the presence of that energy, there is light. Spiritually, it's the same. Spiritually, brethren, it's the same. Darkness, spiritual darkness is not the presence or the addition of something. Spiritual darkness occurs when in the absence of God in our hearts. If we put God aside, if we put the light aside, what is left is darkness, the absence of that light. And that's something to think about. Because it's not a matter of trying to fight darkness, to remove the darkness, but it's a matter of bringing light into our life, to bring in Christ into our life, to bring in God into our life. We need to understand that hope. We need to understand what God has called us for. And that is the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. We have been talking about the glory that God has in store for us, the glory that God has already given us, but we don't quite yet see in its fullness. We have been talking about the inheritance that God has for us. But still, it is not about us. 
or what we get out of it. It is all about Him and what He has given to us, the riches of His glory, His inheritance that has been shared with us, and the surpassing greatness of His power toward us who believe. Now here, in, in this verse, the Greek is so much more emphatic than the English. It actually uses sequentially four different words that they have a meaning ranged around the, the concept of power. The first is dunamis, a spiritual dynamic and living force. The next one is energeia, energetic power. Then he uses the word kratos, the power that overcomes any resistance, unstoppable power. And then the fourth is iskus, God's inherent strength, a term that is only used for God. Can you see the emphasis in just a short sentence that Paul is using to point to the surpassing greatness of God's power toward us, for us. God is for us. God is not against us. God is for us. But notice now in the remaining part of verse 20, uh, 19 and verse 20 and 21. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Only God can save us. Only God can transform us from the weakness that is in uh, characteristic of a human nature to the strength that we find in Christ. Only God has the power to rescue us and to radically transform our life. And I mean radically transform our life. It is His work, a work that He produces in us by the grace of God. We thank you, Lord, for that. A work that He produces in us that he, we voluntarily participate in. Yes, we have a role, we have a part, we have a participation, a, a, a walking along with Him, a following Him that we do. And God brought it all about in Christ. Now, there are three ways in, we, in which Paul here tells us that God uses His power. In raising Christ from the dead, in exalting Christ to His position of supreme authority, and appointing Him to be the head over all the church. It is about Him. It is about Christ. The power of God is manifest in His love, and His love that is demonstrated and manifest in Christ. It's really all about Him. But it's all about Him as God the giver. Because He gave Christ as the head of the church, as the leader of the church. That supreme authority that God has given to Jesus Christ is not a selfish authority. It's not, God's power is not used in a selfish way. God's power is used and expressed in His love and used to serve. And He serves as the head of the church even today. And then He tells us is far above, far above all rule and authority. Above here in, is in the sense, in the meaning of superiority. Christ's authority is far superior to anything else, to all. There is absolutely no authority or no superiority or no, no, no power that is superior to Christ. There is absolutely no power or name that is greater than His. No one is equal. 
No one can ever compete with him. No one in all creation. No one in the whole universe. And it is insane. Absolutely insane. Then a being, a created being like Lucifer, what would one day think that he could overthrow God? That he would go overthrow God and, and dethrone God and, and take his place. That's totally insanity. And let us make sure that we are not allowing ourselves to be influenced by any of that insanity that Satan is broadcasting in this world. Because he's trying. He's using moments. He's using relationships. He's using circumstances and he's doing everything that he possibly can to undermine God's work in us. But we don't want to let him do that. And the way to do the scripture says is by submitting to God, not trying to resist Satan, but submitting to God, because that is what really resists Satan. Satan would love to get us distracted from God. And to think of anything else to be more important in life. But we resist Satan when we surrender to God. And when we concentrate ourselves and our attention on Him. But then it says, Paul adds, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. The supremacy of Christ is not temporary. The supremacy of Christ is permanent. Things will wind down, wind down maybe through our creation perhaps, but God never will. In Him we have absolute and eternal security. We have permanence. We have assurance. And we have a glorious future. A future that will not last just for a moment. There's so many people who seem to, too many, who seem to abandon God for a fleeting moment of pleasure. When God is giving us a glorious future, an eternal future. It is to His glory. Because it is accomplished by Him in and through us. But let's go to verses 22 and 23. He put... And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God gave him, Jesus Christ, as head over all things to the church. Notice that Christ is not only the head of the church, but he's also its fullness. That's quite meaningful. Being the head of a church may be construed or understood as being something detached. Or, well, he's the head, he tells us what to do, and that's pretty much all there is to it. But it is nothing short of amazing that the Lord would choose us to display his majesty, because he's also the fullness of the church. The church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Brethren, the church is never to be passive. And I think in, 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 our, in recent times, we have been way too passive. We must rise in the darkness of this world. We must show the light of God's love. In, we must come together, not just by phone or, 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 or virtually, but in person, in such a way that we can share the love of Christ with one another, to help one another, to assist one another, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to be that oneness that God has created us to be in Christ. For that is the commandment that the Lord left us. That we would love one another, even as He has loved us. Brethren, we are His body. We are created to manifest His work. That's our calling. 
It is a fact that the enemy is seeking to destroy us. But we have nothing to fear because the Lord is far above him and far greater and far more infinitely more powerful than any force in all creation. But God reminds us again and again and again to keep our eyes on the things of God. To be grateful, to be thankful for what the Lord has given us. And to be grateful and thankful that it doesn't depend on us, but it depends on Him. And He has all the love and all the power that it takes to bring it about. The circumstances of life, brethren, may be hard. The annoyances of everyday life may mount, may increase, may seek to distract us, but we are called to keep trusting God. We are called to continue to express His love toward one another. We are called to continue to pray for one another, just like the Apostle Paul is modeling and is showing us. We are reminded that God reveals Himself to us so that we may have a personal relationship with Him. God is calling us to open our eyes and to keep our eyes on the things above, the things of God, here and, and the things of the light, to look at the bright light that God has given us. And He reminds us of the amazing glory that He shared and will share with us, and reminds us that it's all accomplished because of His power, because of His love, not ours. Finally, through Paul, God reminds us that our calling is not a passive one, but a very active one. We're to be involved, to make a difference, not fighting darkness with darkness. And there is way too much going on today. Brethren, there is too much of attempts to fight darkness with darkness, even in the body of Christ. God has told us to overcome evil, not with another evil, but to overcome evil with good. He's called us to fight darkness, but bringing the light of God into this world. Because wherever there is a ray of a light of God, wherever there is a, the presence of a light, darkness is dispelled, because the scripture says, darkness will never, ever, prevail over the light. Brethren, let us also be thankful to God for one another. Let us also pray for one another. But above all, let us express the love of God toward one another and to bring His light, His kindness, His love, His life into this world. God bless you. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Worship 
the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Come to the setting of the sun, 
and our eyes behold the evening light. May we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised, O Son of God, O giver of life. Your glory fills the whole world. 